I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, an Israeli NBA star speaks out against U.S. President Donald Trump. Israelis of Kurdish origin are celebrating the potential of an independent Kurdish state, and Israeli research reveals why honeybees are dying out. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. Now, here's some breaking news. Israel's favorite NBA star Omri Caspi is taking an unlikely political stance against U.S. President Donald Trump as more and more national sports teams are banding together against the divisive American leader. Trump has come under fire for his decision to disinvite Caspi's Golden State Warrior teammate Stephen Curry to a White House reception to celebrate the team's NBA title. Curry hesitated to accept the invitation to the White House due to what he's calling the administration's racist politics and rhetoric. Well, Trump was not happy about that and decided to rescind Curry's invitation before he could get rejected himself. Uh, it's kind of, I mean, surreal to be honest. I mean, just, I don't, I don't, I don't know, you know why he feels the need to target certain individuals other, you know, rather than others. I have an idea of why, but um, it's it's kind of a, it's just kind of beneath, I think, a, a leader of a country to to go that route. Um, it's not what leaders do. So, well, Israeli Omri Caspi is on the same page as his teammate and is accusing Trump of stoking racism and anti-Semitism in the United States, saying that he should be focusing on bringing people together instead. The Stephen Curry incident has now sparked a much larger feud between Trump and professional athletics in the United States. The American president is now taking shots at players who have chosen to kneel instead of stand during the national anthem prior to their games with a focus on the National Football League. We're proud of our country. We respect our flag. Wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners when somebody disrespects our flag to say, get that son of a bitch off the field right now, out, he's fired. He's fired! Trump's cries seem to be falling on deaf ears. New England Patriots owner and Israel advocate Robert Kraft is expressing deep disappointment with Trump and is now denouncing the leader, saying he's proud of his players for trying to make positive social change. It doesn't seem to be bothering Trump, though. I like Bob very much. He's my friend, but he gave me a Super Bowl ring a month ago, right? So he's a good friend of mine, but, uh, and I want him to do what he wants to do, but we have a great country. We have great people representing our country, especially our soldiers, our first responders, and they should be treated with respect. And when you get on your knee and you don't respect the American flag or the anthem, that's not being treated with respect. The NFL Sunday lineup saw over two dozen players take the knee in protest of racism and police violence, while other athletes remained locked arm in arm throughout the national anthem. Well, tensions seem to be at an all-time high. Iran has just paraded sophisticated military equipment through downtown Tehran yesterday, just days after a ballistic missile test. And now the Israeli prime minister has called a special meeting of the security cabinet. The ballistic missile fired on Saturday is capable of hitting Israel and several European cities. President Trump and Israeli security officials have slammed the missile test, suggesting Iran is not honoring the 2015 nuclear accord. The Islamic Republic, however, claims that the missiles are only a defensive measure. While Netanyahu was holding an Israeli cabinet meeting, Iran's Revolutionary Guard took the time to publicly display its Russian-made S-300 air defense system in the heart of Tehran. Israel and several Western powers had repeatedly tried to convince Russia not to sell Iran the highly complex S-300 defense system, but clearly that failed. During the security cabinet meeting, Netanyahu briefed his administration on talks he held with U.S. President Donald Trump and other world leaders at the United Nations. As expected, another major focus of the meeting was Iran's growing presence in Syria. 
Well, throughout the day, thousands and thousands of Kurds in Iraq will be heading to the polls to vote on a referendum of independence. And over here in the Holy Land, Israelis of Kurdish origin are thrilled. Dozens assembled in front of the United States Consulate General in Jerusalem yesterday to show support for the upcoming referendum, which is set to take place in the Kurdish Autonomous Region in northern Iraq later today. Israel is home to around 200,000 Jews of Kurdistani origin, so there was a pretty substantial group of Israeli Kurds singing, dancing, and waving the Kurdish flag. i here to say yes for independence state and the uh, Harbiji Israel who Harbiji Kurdistan. Techi Medinat Israel, Techi Medinat Kurdistan. Earlier this month, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that Israel will not only be supporting the referendum, but that the government, quote, supports the legitimate efforts of the Kurdish people to achieve their own state. We love Kurdistan. We support very much uh, with Kurdistan. Uh, we think uh, Kurdish people is suffering enough and uh, we want uh, independence for Kurdistan. We support with him. Uh, we are here for them and we're making festival for them. The Israeli government believes an independent Kurdish state could help fight off the Iranian threat by giving Israel a rare ally in the region that could sabotage Iran's growing influence in Iraq. Over the last few weeks, Israeli flags have popped up at several Kurdish pro-independence rallies across Europe. And get this, there have even been pictures of Israeli flags being proudly waved in the Kurdistani region of northern Iraq. Germany's latest election has kicked up a storm across the country after the hard-right party AFD won 13 percent of the vote, making it the country's third biggest political force. Now, hundreds of demonstrators have taken to the streets of Berlin, Hamburg and Frankfurt to protest the outcome. Even though Chancellor Angela Merkel clinched the victory and will be serving for a fourth term, her win has been clouded by the rise of the anti-immigrant AFD. This election marks the best showing for the nationalist four since World War II. Called the alternative for Germany, the AFD party has capitalized on a nationalist backlash against Germany's decision to welcome almost 900,000 migrants and refugees in 2015, and claims that their main goal is to fight the Islamization of the West. AFD has also adopted some tactics of the Nazi era, like referring to the media as the lying press. Well, despite their success so far, the party has caused an uproar throughout Germany with protesters chanting slogans like Nazis out and racism is not an alternative. Jewish groups are expressing their alarm with the election's results and the future of democracy in the state of Germany. Well, here to help us understand the results of last night's German election is award-winning author and journalist Tuvia Tenenbaum and his wife, journalist Izzy Tenenbaum. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. So, a lot has been happening in Germany, to say the least. How do you think the Jewish community, you know, is, is feeling after seeing so much success with this party? I think it's divided into two. One is the official, the, the Jewish leaders, so the Yiddish Gemeinde, the head of the Yiddish Gemeinde, or the head of some, or some rabbis who say mm -hmm. whatever they say, and they are, of course, very much against the AFD. AFD. And, but then you have the masses of the people, the Jewish community, which is mostly Russian, about 90% Russian Jewish. Right. And from the people I met, um, they loved the AFD. They actually so that, liked it. That's very interesting I mean, the, because there's a very unique intersectionality in, in this kind of idea of anti-Islam and anti-immigration, right? It's anti-Islam, it's anti-immigration. And the AFD, I mean, I mean, if you really want to know the truth is that the anti-Semitism in Germany today is not on the right side, very little on the right side and very strongly on the left side, on the left and the, and the radical left. So from, from the Jewish perspective, from the mm -hmm. person on the street, the man and woman on the street, the normal Jew, I mean, they have no problem with AFD, because what is AFD? AFD stands, from, from their perspective, against bringing Muslims, whatever it is, you know, to the country. But be proud German, be proud of your culture. And what about the anti-immigration policy? And as, a, as an example, the AFD really, really, you know, focused on the fact that so many refugees were coming into Germany, no? But there, from their point of view, you're talking about, from their point of view, from mm -hmm. the Jewish point of view, they say, okay, what is the AFD about? It's about bringing over a million people undocumented, you know, and 
unvetted. That is for them perspective. And the Muslims, from their perspective, don't like the Jews. So we are with the AFD. Because mm. the AFD, for the most part, not all its, not all its part, you know, is well, pro-Jews in Germany. Interesting. So what is the AFD's stance on Israel? The AFD stance on Israel is the stronger Israel deals with its enemies, the AFD is more pro-Israel from that perspective. They like seeing... it. They like the conserv- They like Netanyahu. Interesting. They like so the now, conservative Jews. And you're seeing, though, you know, these demonstrations all over Germany. I mean, I interview, uh... I interview almost all the leaders. We did it together. We interview uh, the leaders of the AFD, the high AFD, as we say it in German, mm-hmm. um, from Franco Petri, which is trying to make some moves today with AFD, from uh, the head of the new German right, uh, Gets Kubitschek, from the head of Pegida, the ones who demonstrate against the demonstrate, you know, in, in, in Dresden, and from all their parts, they love Israel. I mean, those so, But what, people... what's interesting is that in these demonstrations that you're seeing come out against this party, we're hearing people say, no, Nazis... That's the Antifa. The anti-fascist, usually, you know, it's like they are the ones who make the biggest waves against the, the AfD. And from their pers- from from Jewish perspective, the Antifa is actually very pro-Palestine. So, so you from a Jew perspective, there's... so a Jew says, it's like, why should they be with the Antifa? They are against Israel. Okay, so what about this concept of the, of, of the party using the lying press? But the press is lying. The truth is, I'm, I'm a member of the press, and I, and I can tell you as a member of the press, I always fight with my colleagues. We have been lying through and through all the time. I mean, the, put it in very simple perspective. What the IFD says is what almost every American says. Almost every American. I mean, on the time of Obama, of, you know, for eight years, when Obama was president, America allowed 15,000 uh, Syrians to come in to immigrate to the United States. Just 15,000. That's the reality. And I have that says, those who are in real danger, are, we are okay with them coming. So I'm not saying that I'm for IFD. I'm mm-hmm. saying, I'm just reporting to you what the... the no, I, I, mean, I mean, I think it's very interesting. And Isi, I mean, what is, what is your take uh, on this entire issue? I mean, what does this say about the future of democracy um, in, in the state of Germany? I mean, democracy is that everybody is free to express what they think. Mm-hmm. So it actually it has nothing to do with democracy. They just, there's a big segment of the German population who just don't want immigrants, but they are not allowed to say it because then they are afraid that they, the national co- international community points the finger at them and said, oh, you're Nazis. So that's the biggest fear of the German to be called Nazis. And the, and the truth is that if Frau Petri remained the leader, you know, if they didn't have the IFD, didn't have all this Some fight, inner struggle, inner fight between themselves and inner struggles between them, and if Frau Petri remained the leader, most likely the IFD would have taken at least 25% of the votes. All right. Well, listen, we, we have run out of time, unfortunately. I think we could go on about this all day. But for those of our viewers who are interested in learning more about what is happening on the ground in Germany through the perspective of, of the Tenenbaums, we have these two amazing new books. Well, not this is a new book. Hello, Refugees. This just, is about the refugee issue. Exactly, and, about the refugee issue and that came out. And interviews with the leaders of the IFD and the leaders of the, of the extreme left and the left from the from the polit- politicians from the extreme right to the extreme left, all the, all the old circle. And then, of course, I Sleep in Hitler's Room, which is a bestseller. Um, and again, comes back to the very issue that we're speaking about. So thank you, too, so thank much for much. coming in. Thank, thank you for having us. All right. It's been a pleasure. A senior Russian official will be arriving to Israel in mid-October following several high-profile political meetings between Russia and Israel. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu will be making a historic and rare visit to the Holy Land this upcoming October, marking his first trip to Israel since becoming Defense Minister in 2012. The visit comes after Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met Russian President Vladimir Putin last month in the Russian resort city of Sochi. The Israeli leader, as per usual, stressed to Putin that Israel is concerned with Iran's involvement in the Syrian civil war and, quote, increasing efforts to establish its military foothold in Syria. During his visit, Shoigu will be meeting with his Israeli counterpart, Avigdor Lieberman. The two will, of course, focus on military coordination in Syria. 
The Russian government has openly backed Syrian President Bashar al-Assad during the country's six-year civil war by providing troops and a political backbone. While it's true that Israel and Russia maintain very strong relations, the two have quietly clashed over Iran. Russia continues to insist that Iran is key to resolving the crisis in Syria, while Israel warns that Iran's involvement in Syria is a major security threat to the Jewish state. Israeli security officials have asked Russia to make sure Iranian-backed Shiite forces stay 60 kilometers away from Israel's border, but according to reports, Russia has denied this request. Israeli officials hope to receive more clarity from Shoigu and his entourage during the upcoming visit. Shocking news. Experts in Argentina have just confirmed that the prosecutor Alberto Nisman was assassinated by two people just a day before he was set to testify about the bombing of the Amiad Jewish Center in Buenos Aires. Nisman's body was found on January 18th of 2015, only a few hours before he was going to present evidence that the then Argentine president Cristina Fernández de Kirchner had covered up Iran's role in the 1994 attack on the Jewish center, which left 85 dead and hundreds wounded. Now, local investigators have handed over a report to the courts revealing that Nisman had been beaten on his body as another person tried to subdue him and drugged with anesthetic ketamine. Eastman was found dead with a bullet from a 22 caliber that had been found in his apartment, leading police to claim that he had committed suicide. But suspect IT specialist Diego Lago Marcino is now saying that he went to Nisman's apartment to give him that very pistol, so that he could actually protect himself from the impending attack. Lago Marcino is apparently under hidden surveillance right now out of concern that he might flee justice. Argentina has previously accused the Iranian-backed Hezbollah terror organization of carrying out the attack against the Amia Jewish Center. The late Nisman was responsible for establishing how and when Iran commissioned the deadly bombing, along with another attack back in 1992 that left 29 dead in front of the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires. Given the history of the Jewish people, it's no surprise that the state of Israel strongly values its historic documents, photos, and letters, sometimes even more than money itself. And now that banks no longer offer vault services, many choose to safeguard their precious valuables at home, which can be extremely dangerous. Well, for the first time, Israel has inaugurated personal safety deposit boxes in Israel. And here to tell us more is the CEO of Brickstone's unique safe deposit box, Dvir Indik. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Natasha. All right, so tell us a little bit about this new complex and, and why it's so important to have one here in Tel Aviv. Okay, uh, for the first, uh, I'll tell you that uh, this service was only, uh, only uh, was operated by the banks in Israel for many years. And the banks are running out of safe deposit box. They're closing them one by one because they're closing all the, all the, most of the branches and because they're, they're going to e-banking and internet banking and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And um, and the, the 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 solution of safe deposit box is 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 the is the, is the most um, unique uh, solution because a safe at home it's it's having a lot of risks. You have a lot of risk for your family because burglars can come and uh, and uh, threaten your loved ones. And most of the most of the safes at home, so the regular safes, mm -hmm. even the big ones, are probably uh, not as strong. They're right? not strong, and they most of them are. are uh, are open by a few five, by a few minutes, and and the big ones are well. Pulled you know, out. with the complex that you guys have created here, is there an extra level of security as well? Are there people who of are, are okay? Of so course. tell us a little bit about that. Okay, this this uh, facility is uh, guarded by G4S uh, security, armed security personnel, and wow. uh, Team Three, to the most two uh, big uh, security companies in companies in Israel, security companies in Israel. And uh, each client has uh, uh, all, only enters the, the compound with a special biometric scan of fingerprint and uh, face, facial, facial recognition. Facial recognition. And so that wasn't uh, by the banks. Uh, and so who are some of the clients that are using this? I mean, ha have people heard about the complex? Who are your main people, your main clients? Um, most of the cli our clients are clients that are thrown, up, thrown out from the banks. And they come with, with the, they, they they say uh, the bank uh, threw me out and I have to find a place for my valuables, and uh, there's a lot of special uh, uh, stories. Uh, people. Yeah, I, I was thinking about tell us the coolest story. I'm not sure if you can, right? Because that's the point of a safety in, lock. In, in Brixton, we're obligated to uh, discussion, <laughs> but uh, one client uh, permitted me to I tried to, to, break to, to to say anonymous, anonymously that uh, he hold all his 
precious uh, love letters from all from from childhood to, to uh, uh, until it was grown. Wow. And, okay. Uh, and some uh, um, some uh, software companies that want to hold uh, not uh, backup on, on on cloud and on on offline on hard drive back backup. They put it in our safe deposit box. Very interesting. Well, you know, I think this is something that our viewers probably didn't really think about themselves, but is a huge thing for the state of Israel, given yes. our history as well. There are a lot of precious documents that uh, we care about uh, preserving here. So thank you so much for coming in and telling us about this new complex, and the best of luck to you. Thank you, Natasha. All right, well, a new Israeli scientific study has revealed some groundbreaking information about why honeybees are dying. Now, for those of you who don't understand how big of a deal this is, let's just put it this way. We can't live without them. According to the United States Department of Agriculture, honeybees pollinate 80% of our flowering crops, which is essentially one third of everything we eat. Losing honeybees could not only affect the amount of apples, strawberries, nuts, and cucumbers we're able to grow, but also our beef and dairy industries. A Cornell University study has estimated that honeybees annually pollinate a whopping $14 billion worth of seeds and crops in the United States alone. In other words, if honeybees disappear, we're in deep trouble. Well, thanks to Hebrew University's Faculty of Agriculture, we could be in luck. A groundbreaking experiment conducted at the Benjamin Triwalks Bee Research Center has helped explain why honeybees are dying. The results of the experiment show that the bees are consuming an unhealthy ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids and are developing cognitive deficiencies. This gives the bees a serious nutritional imbalance and health problems, which ultimately leads to their death. But have no fear. Now that we know this, the researchers say they're working on ways to make sure bees maintain a healthy diet. You may not know it, but Israel is home to some of the most successful fashion designers on the planet. And with us now is ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh to tell us about one young Israeli designer who's becoming a hit worldwide. Yeah, well, 19-year-old Maya Reich may still be a teenager, but she's already had years of experience. Maya actually has a really interesting story. She dropped out of school at 14 years old and basically taught herself how to design and create pieces. And by the time she was 17, she started her own brand called Mariah 1998. Amazing. Now, what is her style like? I'm assuming because she's so young, her style is for a younger audience, or no, is that not the case? Um, no, it's actually not. It's funny because that's almost the opposite of what she does. She has very elegant, stunning silk dresses and a style fur trimmed robes from like the 1930s. Vogue mm -hmm. said it perfectly, gorgeously grown up clothes. We're just like growing up clothes yes. for a 19 year old. All right. So even Vogue is talking about her, which is also a huge deal. Exactly. Where can we find her next? Well, her website is up and running at Mariah1998.com. And I actually read an article from the New York Times where she said she wanted her website to be more like an online diary type thing where she can feel like an open book. Hmm. She does sort of blog posts on her site. She puts an outfit together. Then she tells us a little bit about her, you know, a little bit about her story, about where the fabrics are from, where the piece was made, also where she stayed that weekend, like in Milan or whatever. And at the end, she tells us where you can buy the outfit from her story, things like that. Half insanely talented fashion designer and half fashion blogger. Definitely worth checking out. All right. Well, we have something to look forward to this year, and that's for sure. I can't wait to see uh, Fashion Week in Tel Aviv yes. and how huge Maya is going to be getting in the international fashion world. So thank 100%. you for joining us, Emmanuel. Enroll in eTeacher's online Hebrew courses and quickly discover that it creates the deepest connection to Israel that you could ever imagine. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. Bees are key to the survival of humankind, so today's word is devora, which means bee in Hebrew. Most kids are scared of devorim or bees, but when I was a kid, I always tried to get an up-close look. I mean, they're pretty cute and furry if you think about it. Yes, I know, a dvola can sting you, but its benefits to our world are much greater than your temporary wound. Dvolim pollinate 80% of our flower and crops, which is essentially one-third of everything that we eat. And let's not forget, without them, we wouldn't be able to dip our apples into honey during this holiday season. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be partly cloudy with a low of 73 or 23 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow you can expect little to no change in temperatures with a high of 84 or 29 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.51 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.